folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We're dealing with Matthew chapter 24, what Jesus warned us about concerning the last days in relation to false prophets. Now, uh, we had covered this area before back in Deuteronomy 18 where the people of Israel asked Moses, okay, Moses, so God's telling us not to follow false prophets. How do we know a false prophet from a real prophet? Moses gave an explanation, came from God, of course, and God said that if the prophet speaks in my name and he prophesies a sign or a wonder, the sign or the wonder does not come to pass. It doesn't happen then you don't have to be afraid of that particular prophet because he's not from me. In other words, God sets the highest standard possible. The prophet of God has to be 100% correct. Can never, ever, ever be wrong one time, even about the smallest detail. It cannot be wrong. So that's really how we identify the false prophets of this world of previous times, previous eras, those who've written false prophecies in books like Ellen White and Joseph Smith with the Book of Mormon and Pearl of Great Price and all that stuff. How we determine their false prophets is that we compare what they say with what the Bible says. Now, and this is what we're going to deal with today. One of the methods that false prophets use, and if you know of a pastor, preacher, prophet, priest, YouTube channel speaker, blog writer, anybody on Facebook, anybody on the internet, if you know somebody that does what I'm about to tell you, then they manifest signs of being a false prophet or a false teacher. That's what uh, Jesus used the word false prophet, Matthew 24. I'll read that verse in a minute. Uh, Peter used the phrase when he was talking about the false prophets. He, he said in uh, Second. Peter chapter 2, he said, that, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. So today, while not, you know, very many people, especially on the internet, would refer to themselves as a prophet, they would call themselves a teacher, a YouTube teacher a blog teacher, someone who teaches the ways of God. And yet, there's one way to identify whether you should even listen to them or not listen to them. And I'm going to show you that today. And, I, and I'm not saying that every one of these people are false teachers, false prophets, because at one time, I was wrong concerning what I'm going to show you today, okay? So I guess maybe at that time I might have, well, in fact, I know I did say some things that were just blatantly wrong, but then God corrected me. And I still believe God is in the correcting business. The Word of God, Paul told Timothy about the, the Scriptures that they're perfect, and that they're there to correct the man of God so that he can be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And I believe that there are still preachers, pastors, YouTube speakers, blog writers that can still be corrected. God hasn't turned them over to a reprobate mind yet. The Bible says, judge no man before the time. Had people judged me, and I'm sure they did, 
back in a time where I was saying, I don't think any translation is right. I think they all have mistakes in them. I learned Greek and Hebrew in college, so if you want the truth, you have to get it from me. During those days, I'm sure people judged me, but God still had a work that he was going to do in my life. And by the way, he still has a work he wants to do in my life. I would not say for a minute that I've attained unto complete perfection, have no need of correction whatsoever. God is still in the correcting business. He still corrects me. He still corrects you. And there are people out there who say things that are wrong right now that one of these days, they'll change. They'll come around. Okay? So judge no man before the time. However, having said that, some people are just blatantly false prophets, false teachers. God has turned them over to a reprobate mind. Their conscience has been seared with a hot iron. They worship and serve the creature more than the creator and all of those other signs that go into play here. So let's get into the scripture. Matthew 24, verse 11. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, meaning sin, the sin's going to grow and keep growing and getting worse, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, last week we started out showing you from Ezekiel chapter 13 about the false prophets, the teachers, the priests, the religious experts who were building this gospel of salvation like a wall. They were doing it with untempered mortar. So let's read that because we're going to start from there because I mentioned last week there was another chapter in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 22, that dealt with that and there's a few things there that I think we need to uncover that will hopefully make sense. It'll, it'll click together in your mind why these false teachers do and say what they do. Why do they teach the doctrines that they teach? Why are they, are they deliberately misleading souls? Do they know they're misleading souls? No, because I think they themselves have been misled as well. So let's start out Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 10. Because, even because, they have seduced my people, saying, peace, and there was no peace. Remember, we're always at war. There's always devils, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places, familiar spirits, unclean spirits. You name the spirit, they're always coming after us every day. There's a war going on. We had, need to have a sword in our hand. We need to have our helmet of salvation on. We need to have our breastplate of righteousness on. No police officer goes on duty without wearing his bulletproof vest nowadays. I mean, back in the old days, they didn't wear them. Kind of like back in the old days in hockey where goalies didn't wear a mask. What, are you kidding me? Now they all, now everybody wears a mask and a helmet in hockey. Cops just don't go on duty without wearing that bulletproof vest. Why? Because there's, they know there's the potential that that day somebody might try to pull a trigger on them and kill them. Without that vest, they would almost surely die. So we're at war every day. And anybody who tells you that there's just peace and peace and peace and you don't have to worry about this and all you have to do is think positive thoughts and all that witchcraft that we learned last week, right? They seduced my people saying peace and there was no peace and one built up a wall and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar that it shall fall, there shall be an overflowing shower and ye, O great hailstones, shall fall and a stormy wind shall rend it. So last week, again, we learned the difference between tempered mortar, where they take the limestone out of the ground, wherever they find it, they bake it. Then they add, which is the tempering process. 
Then they add water, which causes a chemical reaction because the heat has changed the molecules of the limestone. They add water to it. Now it's ready to be cement. Add water to it again. Boom, you've got cement and it hardens right back into rock again. But apparently they're not doing that. They're not using... Remember, because lime is recyclable, which means it lasts forever. But they're using clay, dirt, which the first time the wind blows, the first time the hail comes down, the first time it rains, it's going to destroy that wall because it was put together with untempered mortar. Clay always equals the flesh. And anything that has to do with the flesh is temporary. This body, this flesh is temporary. So they're giving people a temporary hope, temporary salvation, a temporary good feeling. You know, you can go to a church. They can uplift you with this music. They can tell funny stories and make you laugh. They can tell you emotional stories to make you cry. They can tell you all sorts of witty things that will, that will uh, create emotional responses in you and make you feel good. But you could get that going to a play, going to a, uh, a baseball game, a football game, a soccer game. You can, go, you can get that watching a movie, watching a TV show. You can get that from any, you can get that reading a book. You see, it's temporary. Makes you feel good for a while, but it has not fixed nor changed the issues in your life because it came out of their flesh, untempered mortar. They lied. The lie sounded good. You believed it, and you fell for it. Okay? Now, in verse 12 of Ezekiel 13, here's what God said was going to happen. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, Where is the daubing wherewith ye have daubed it? Therefore thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger. Think about what Jesus said as it was in the days of Noah. And great hailstones, think of Revelation 8, in my fury to consume it. So will I break down the wall that ye have daubed with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered and it shall fall and ye shall be consumed in the midst thereof. And then he says, when that happens, ye shall know that I am the Lord. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar, and will say unto you, The wall is no more. Neither they that daubed it, to wit the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord God. Now, here's the hope of why I do what I do. It's so that even if you have gone to all these other churches where they give you feel-good messages, they give you uh, a professionally produced theatrical church service, they stir up and give you an emotional high that lasts throughout the service and you get out to the car and by the time you get home, by the end of the day, all of the problems that you had before are still there and they manifest throughout that week. But you keep thinking that, well, I, you know, the preacher said I need to apply these things or I need to think positive thoughts and it's probably just all my fault and I'm not doing it right and on and on and on and on. And you've done that. I've had people contact our ministry, say, Pastor, we were in the Hebrew roots. We were in the sacred name. We were in the mega church. We were in the Bethel Redding, New Apostolic Reformation. We were, we were, used to be Catholics. We used to be Lutherans. We used to be all of that stuff. We used to be in the New Age. We used to, people contact me all the time. 
And they said, because when we heard you, we kept hearing these words out of the King James Bible. It changed us. Not what I did, not what I said, but the words of this book. And because repeatedly over all the years that I've been doing the Watchman broadcast, preaching the church services here, Pastor Mike online, everything that I do, I'm going to give you lots of Bible verses. And it's the Word of God which is quick, meaning it's alive and powerful. And it's the Word of God that people find the resting place that they've been looking for. Because they've been to the church that daubed the wall with untempered mortar, and the storms of life come, don't they? you have a death in the family, or you have a very tragic incident, somebody gets into a lot of trouble, in, or you get into a lot of trouble, or your marriage is headed for divorce, or your marriage has already broken up and you've already been divorced, and your kids rebel against you, and just the things of life happen. And all of that, that candy and sweets and puffed rice krispies that you got at these other churches didn't help you it left you empty and that wall of untempered mortar collapsed the foundation was discovered and it left you with absolutely nothing and so you were about ready to give up when all of a sudden you heard Watchman video broadcast or Pastor Mike online and you heard the King James Bible and you finally said, my faith has found a resting place, not in me. I don't want you to put your faith in me. Don't put your confidence in me. Don't put your trust in me. I will let you down every time. Put your confidence on the Lord Jesus Christ and his word this book and that's what's made the difference in you amen so the reason why I'm keep doing what I'm doing is that I know there are others out there like I love this story it's my favorite story the guy who was a Roman Catholic he lived by himself in an apartment he took his laundry to the laundromat washed to wash and dry his clothes. On the folding table was these videos from a guy named Mike Hoggard. I didn't put them there. I don't even know what city it was in. Somebody had made copies of these videos and put them on the table. And this guy folding his clothes, put them in the basket. He decided to pick one up, put it. And when he got home, he put that video in and he watched it. And he was absolutely so amazed at hearing the wondrous things out of God's Word. And he went back to the laundromat, got all the rest of them, and did a binge watch of all of the videos that were on that table, went out, bought himself a King James Bible, got down on his face before God, gave his life to the Lord, and is serving the Lord. I love that story. Because now your faith has finally found its resting place. And I'm hoping that others out there will listen to the Word of God. And once they do, then they will be able to tell the difference between the truth of the Word of God and the false prophets, the false teachers, the false ministries, the false Bibles, the false salvation, the false spirits, they'll be able to tell the difference. And they'll know. That's what he, that's what he said. When, when I break all of this stuff down, when I break that wall down and show you the foundations, then you'll know that I am the Lord your God. And that's what's happened, right? God had to destroy all of those other religious things that you were doing 
to bring you to this book. Now you know who the Lord is. The Lord is this book. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. Amen? So now, where do false prophets come from? What is it that makes a guy go completely off the rails of the Word of God and start teaching false doctrine? What, what causes that to happen? How is it that someone who may have grown up conservative, heard conservative King James Bible preaching, and thought they were going to be a conservative preacher and tell the truth of the Word of God, all of a sudden over the years, they start going nuts and they start teaching all these false doctrines and they start trying to uh, make their church big, turn it into a mega church. So they go to Rick Warren seminars or they bring in Rodney Howard Brown with the holy laughter or whatever it is. What is it that makes a denomination, a pastor, a person or whoever just go completely away from the truth of the word of God? Well, God gives us an answer to that. It's in Ezekiel. So we were in Ezekiel 13. Now let's go to Ezekiel 14, because the answer is right there in that chapter. Son of man, and let me set it up. The prophets and the religious leaders of Israel came to Ezekiel, who they knew was a man of God, and they said, go inquire of God for us. In other words, go ask God to give you a word for us. So Ezekiel goes to God. And God says this, son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Stop right here. Two things. Number one, God says, I know these guys. I know them better than you do. You don't see what I see. I'm with them every day. I, I see them at night. I see them during the day. I see them in secret. I see them in places where not even their wife knows they are, I see every, and know everything to know about them. Number one, they've got idols in their heart. They pretend on the outside to be worshiping me, but they're not worshiping me. They've got a false God in their heart. You know, Paul said that covetousness is idolatry, and covetousness comes out of the heart of man. So you can, co you can covet after a woman or a man, and nobody around you who knows you would even know that you're doing it, right? Does God? Sure he does. So God says, number one, I know these guys, and they have covetousness, they have idolatry in their heart, they've got idols in their heart. Number two, they've put the stumbling block of their iniquity in their life, they're, trip, they're constantly tripping over their own sins. They've got sin in their life that they refuse to get rid of. They refuse to ask me to take it away from them. So, they, act, they, they want to act spiritual, coming to you to inquire of me so that I can give them some great, holy, true word for them. God says, I ain't doing it. Fact is, I'll answer them according to the abundance of idols and the stumbling blocks of their iniquity in their heart. That's how I'll answer them. Look at what he says. He says, therefore speak unto them and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. So, stop right here. The equivalent of that today in the 21st century is, they all say they're Christians. But God knows the difference. 
God knows who really is and who really isn't and never will be. So the reason why there are so many false prophets and so many, because Jesus said that many false prophets shall deceive many. The reason why there are so many is that people love sin and they love the lies more than they love God and the truth. So when the word of God talks about the sodomites and removing the sodomites out of the land they don't want to hear that because either they are closet sodomites or they've got family members that are sodomites and we, we, we can't offend them so they go along with a church that goes along with a Bible that took the word sodomite out of the land and replaced it with like shrine prostitutes Oh, those are bad. But let's take out sodomites so we don't condemn them. And God knows that. God knows that about the people who are sitting in the pews, and God knows that about the preacher behind the pulpit. He's not going to say anything against the sin of sodomy or the sin of shacking up or the sin of this. Why? Because he's involved in his own sin. And he figures, you know, I'm just as good a Christian as anybody else is. Even though I have all this sin in my life, therefore, God must accept these poor sinners just the way they are. So I will accept them just the way they are. Now, there's a difference. Do I want sodomites to come to my church? Absolutely. Absolutely but then I want God to change them like he's changed me and all of the other people here and you. That's the difference because a lot of people go to churches and they're never changed. It's because the word of God will not tell them the truth. They will not hear the truth from the word of God. God will answer them according to the abundance of their idols and the stumbling block of their iniquities. So, he says, verse 6, Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me, and setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I the Lord will answer him by myself. And I will set my face against that man, and will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prop watch this now, and pay attention to what God says, because we're going to explain what he means by that. And, and before I read the rest of this, ask the question, does God ever lie? No. So now watch this. Verse 9, And if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. And you say, now wait a minute, Pastor. We just said God never lies. But God here said that if a prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. Well, there's a way. You see, you don't just take one part of the Bible and say, aha, you have to do what Isaiah 28 says. Here a little, there a little, what Paul said, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. How does God allow a prophet to be deceived? And then thus deceiving all of the people who listen to that prophet. And all of this is about the people 
who would rather hear a lie so that they keep their sin. That's what this is all about. So we actually have an illustration in the Bible of how God allows a prophet, preacher, speaker, teacher, YouTube evangelist, whatever, to be deceived. It's the story of Ahab. Because, Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? So we see the answer here clearly that God is not like us that can lie. God doesn't change his word. Once God says it, he means what he says. He doesn't deceive anybody, but he allows people to be deceived. How? 1 Kings 22. So the setup is Ahab has had uh, Naboth killed because of Jezebel. And God has sworn that in the place where Naboth was hung, the dogs were going to lick Ahab's blood in that exact same spot. So God's already prophesied that Ahab is going to be killed and his blood's going to be shed. And here's how God's going to do it. God's going to send Ahab out to war. Ahab's going to get hit with an arrow. They're going to bring his chariot back. And guess what? The chariot is going to, it's going to stop. They're going to get Ahab out of it. A guy's going to clean the chariot. And the place that he used water to clean the chariot out, the blood of Ahab flows out, the dogs lick it up, and it's the exact spot that Ahab had Naboth killed. Okay? See, God is it's awesome. He can orchestrate all of these things to work out to do exactly what he wants done. God does everything. He's perfect at it. But he's got to get Ahab to go to war. So Ahab's got it in his mind. I think I'm going to go to war tomorrow. And he's got King Jeho Ahab is the king of, Sam of Samaria and the ten northern tribes. Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah and Benjamin, the southern tribe. So he's got Jehoshaphat with him. And he says, Jehoshaphat, why don't you bring your armies with us? We'll go to war together. We'll win. Jehoshaphat says, well, how do you know we're going to win? He said, oh, I, I, I already believe that we're going to win. And I can, in fact, I can get my you know, prophets in here. And, eight, and Jehoshaphat said, yeah, I kind of wish you would because I'd like to hear from God on this. So Ahab whistles up all of his prophets. And one of them takes some iron and makes some horns out of it and says, with these horns, Ahab, you're going to push the enemy back and you're going to win. And Ahab says, see, all of these 400 prophets, they've all said the same thing. It must be God, right? Now remember, these prophets are false prophets, many false prophets. Jehoshaphat ain't buying it. Jehoshaphat, if you remember from 2 Chronicles, I think it's 2 Chronicles chapter 20, where the Edomites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites come against him, Jehoshaphat calls to God and says, God, we can't win this war. Will you save us? And God saved him. So Jehoshaphat's got a little bit more understanding of how God works and how God speaks than Ahab does. And, and Jehoshaphat says, don't you have somebody else besides these 400 guys? Because they all said the same thing. I don't trust that. And Ahab says, well, I got this Micaiah, but I don't like him. Why don't you like him? Well, he never tells me what I want to hear. Now, you think long and hard about that. The amount of people who go to churches every Sunday and they go to a specific church 
because they know that that church will not speak out against their particular sin. That's why they go to it. So they can keep sinning, go to church, fool themselves and the world into thinking they're a Christian, but they're not fooling God. So you got churches all over the world who tell people what they want to hear. And that's why they go there. So pick it up. 1 Kings 22, verse 7. Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him. For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. So if we skip down to verse 19, here's what Micaiah said. And he said, hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner and another said on that manner. And there came forth the spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. And of course, they didn't like that. And one of the guys from Ahab's side went up and beat Micah in the face and he said, which way did the Lord send that one, huh? So the bottom line is, this is how God does it. God himself cannot lie. So his spirit is not going to go enter into people, men or women, and deliberately lie. He doesn't need to. God has created an organization of evil spirits, unclean spirits, evil angels, gods, familiar spirits, you name it. He's got a whole division, one third of the angels, that will lie, that will tempt people, that will enter into people, do all kinds of things. So God simply asks the question, who will go and deceive Ahab? And this spirit said, I will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And God said, go do it. So, I mean, think about this. One spirit entering into 400 men. Now, I don't understand how that works. I just believe that it does because that's what the Bible said happened. So, all of these false speakers, false prophets, false teachers, where did they get their doctrines from? Where did they get their miracles from? Because some of them do miracles, obviously. Where do they, how do they produce signs and wonders? All of it is done by devils, by spirits. Where does, the, where does the holy laughter come from? It comes from devil spirits. Where does the speaking in the gibberish unknown tongue come from? It comes from these spirits. Where does the what we saw couple weeks ago, the violent jerking and the uncontrolled mo emotions that people were doing. Where does that come from? These unclean spirits. So God, knowing that number one, the preachers don't want to tell the truth. Number two, the people don't want to hear the truth. So God has enough spirits to send out to say, tell them this, tell them this, 
lie to them, be a lying spirit in their mouths, have them convince other people. Remember, Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. And God uses these spirits to lie to people who only want to be lied to and to be in the mouth of those who only want to lie. So again, if you know the truth, get out on your face before God and tell God, thank you. Now, do you believe in conspiracies? I know the mainstream media has made conspiracies an evil thing. Oh, he believes in conspiracy theories. He must be wacko. There is no conspiracy. Is, let me ask you, is there a conspiracy to promote evolution all around the world so that people don't believe that God created the universe? Is there a conspiracy? Yes, absolutely. Is there a conspiracy to cover up the fact that giants once roamed the earth? Oh, yeah, because we have these stories of people going through as they're uh, settling these towns in America, east to west, going out, finding these humongous skeletal remains, sending them to the Smithsonian Institute, and all of a sudden, there's no record of them ever being there. How can that be? So, is there a conspiracy among religious people to deliberately lie to mankind to bring him to the age where the Antichrist will rule over them. Is there a conspiracy? Yes, the Bible says so. Ezekiel 22. This also deals with untempered mortar. Let's read it. Ezekiel 22:25. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. Stop right here. Where do you think Peter got what he said from? Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Where do you think he got it from? He got it from Ezekiel 22. And this is in the context of the conspiracy of the prophets. The prophets, the preachers, the false teachers, the YouTube channel preachers. Why do they have a YouTube channel? Why do they monetize their videos? Because they know that if they can get people to watch them, they'll get money out of it. And no, I never monetize my videos. Never. Never have and never will. So a conspiracy of the prophets to lie, to deceive people, to, like roaring lions, go after them, to spoil them, to take away things from them. Give us of your money. And believe it or not, you've got poor people, people on pensions, people on government benefits who are writing, they're sending in their life savings to some of these false prophets. That's wicked. They've devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things, and they have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. You remember when we were talking about the drunken spirit? Again, you don't have to be rolling in the floor laughing hysterically to be or to have a drunken spirit. All you have to do is display the fact that you don't know the difference between holy and profane, between clean and unclean. You have your band play Highway to Hell, 
at the beginning of the church service, but you don't see anything wrong with that. That means you're drunk with an unclean, unholy spirit. And you don't know the difference between holy and profane. So he says in verse 27, her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey. Wolves dressed up like sheep to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. You see where it says that they have destroyed souls to get dishonest gain. You remember Hophni and Phinehas? Let me explain something to you. There was, God had provided very well in the law. He had provided very well for the Levite priests. Levite priests were not allowed to own land. Therefore, they couldn't own cattle. They couldn't they couldn't do what the rest of the Israelites were doing with land. If you owned land, you could own cattle, you could grow, you know, wheat and crops and grapes and whatever. You could you could use that land to grow and and to make your living. But the Levite priests were not allowed to do that. They were not given a portion of the land. What they were given a portion of was the sacrifices that were brought in and the tithe that was brought in. And it was distributed amongst the Levite priest. Now, God had written into the law exactly what part of a lamb, a ram, a goat, an ox, bullock, whatever, what part of that that the priest could have for their own food. But you remember what Hophni and Phinehas were doing? They took a three-pronged hook, and when people would bring in a sacrifice, and they would put it in the pot, they would just stick that hook in and pull out whatever they wanted. And it got to the point, this is kind of my thinking, it got to the point to where people said, why am I even going to the tabernacle to give this to the Lord? Because the Lord's never getting it. Hophni and Phinehas are stealing it. And it's the same is true today. God uses tithes and offerings for the upkeep of the church and to provide for the living of its minister. That's what it's for. But then you got guys like a preacher I knew that had access to all the church money and he was stealing it. Stealing right out of the church coffers. Another pastor I know in this town using church money to pay the rent, the utilities, and a little extra money for his mistress until the church found it out. That stuff happens everywhere. Dishonest gain. So he said, and her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity, divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. So, how do we know, again, how do we know what the Lord has spoken? It's simple. He speaks it right here. I watched a video from a young man the other day. He's got a whole YouTube channel full of his own prophecies and visions and how he hears from God. And he said the other night, he said, I laid in my bed and he said, I just decided I was going to lay there and lay there and lay there and not even get up until God spoke to me. And he said, it was like 18, 20 hours before he heard from God. He said, God must have been testing me. Now, how did he hear from God? Well, I don't really know. Maybe he finally decided that whatever thought came into his mind, well, that was from God. So that's what he ran with. Me? 
I would like, boy, I need to hear from God. Do I have to wait? No, I just open my Bible and, and read. Now, sometimes it does take a little time searching the scriptures to find things that God wants to say to me at a particular time. You've heard me say that, you know, sometimes I'll be in distress and I'll open my Bible and it'll just open up to the place that, and I'll read it, and boy, there, there is God's answer to that. I believe that happens. I don't believe it happens every time. Because I think God wants us to not use this as like throwing dice. Oh, that must be for me because that's what I opened up to. I don't believe in that. I think sometimes you have to search. The Bereans didn't just go, well, I heard what the apostles said. I wonder if what they said is true or not. And they just opened to some place in the Bible and they read it and they went, well, where I open up to didn't match what they said, so obviously these guys are wrong. They didn't do that, did they? They searched the scriptures. They read this, and then they read this, and then they read this. There's questions that I ask God that he eventually did answer months or years later, but not right away. There's things, there are things that I'm asking God about now that I don't have an answer to. And I didn't just open the Bible up and think, well, it's got to be right here. No, search the scriptures, people. Search them. Or you could get an answer that's not from the Lord, even though you read it in his book. Search the scriptures. God will tell you. Okay. So, again, how do we know the difference between what God said and what God didn't say? If God says it in this book, God says it. If it's not in this book, God did not say it. So let me give you some examples of false prophets, false teachers, false preachers, false churches who try to draw you away from what's in this book to their own vanity. The vanity that enriches them and blesses them and leaves you with absolutely nothing. Do you really think that all that money that Robert Tilton and Jim Baker and Kenneth Copeland and all those other guys, do you really think that all that money that they take in, that that blesses all of the people that send them all the money? No, it blesses Jim Baker and Robert Tilton and Kenneth Copeland and Joyce Meyer. It benefits them greatly, but it, it doesn't do a thing for the people who send in the money. They're now without their money, period. But it sure benefits them. So let's examine some ways that people, false prophets, draw you away. They don't want you to believe what's in this book because what they're going to tell you is going to contradict what's in this book. And so they have to embed it in your mind. You can't trust everything the Bible says. However, you can trust everything we say. <laughs>